Hi, I'm Selena from Annie's Bookstop of Worcester, and I'm here with Charlie Lovett. And uh, Charlie is uh, an author who has uh, written in several different uh, genres. And actually, he has three books coming out in September. And Charlie, why don't you talk a little bit about those three books? Sure. Um, I have a, a new novel coming out in on the 6th of September from Blackstone um, called The Enigma Affair, which... Uh, my elevator pitch for that is small town librarian and professional assassin team up to solve 75 year old Nazi mystery and maybe save the world. Uh, so I, I really wanted to write a thriller. I'd never written a straight thriller before. And that was, that was lots of fun. Um, then two weeks after that comes out, I have two, two more books coming out on the same day. They various different COVID delays have sort of slowed things down in the, in parts of the publishing world. So I have, um, a new biography of Lewis Carroll, who, if you see the poster behind me, you will know is one of my my passions, um, called Lewis Carroll Formed by Faith, that, that looks at his religious life, um, which is something that hasn't really been looked at in depth uh, by previous biographers. Uh, and then I have a middle grade book. I, I spent a lot of years writing plays for kids. Um, and so it's really been fun to go back and write for kids again. Um, and so it's a it's the first of a trilogy called the Book of the Seven Spells about four very different children who discover a magical library and have to um, keep a very powerful magical book out of the hands of somebody who really shouldn't have his hands on such a thing. <laughs> oh, wow. That sounds really interesting. So what what can readers expect from your latest book? And I believe that's the Enigma Affair. Yeah. So as I said, it's um, Enigma Fair is a thriller. I, I really wanted to write a book where the protagonist was in peril on in the first paragraph. Um, you know, it starts with uh, Patton Harcourt. The protagonist is at home in her house in the in the countryside uh, trying to make a recipe that she read about on the or saw on the Great British Baking Show. And suddenly there's there's um, bullets flying through her kitchen and embedding themselves in her meatloaf. And so she has to um, sort of react to that situation. Um, but I also, um, it's also got sort of a World War II background. Uh, I, my wife and I both got really fascinated by, um, I guess you would say sort of the, a lot of the non-military aspects of World War II, and in particular, the intelligence and code-breaking aspects. Uh, and we've been to Bletchley Park where the Enigma Code was broken by Alan Turing and other people um, several times. And we actually had a, a fairly close friend who, who worked at Bletchley. Um, and I didn't ever know what an important code breaker she was until after she died because, you know, they weren't supposed to talk about it. Um, so I just knew her as, you know, my friend Mavis Beatty. And I think she was at Bletchley, but we're not really sure what she did. And we we found out some years later, you know, now her name is all over the museum and she was she was one of the real key, key people. Um, so knowing Mavis and um, we have we had another acquaintance, a, a very good friend of mine, his mother also worked at Bletchley, knowing, knowing some of the people who actually had been there, um, you know, really made me want to write something that had to do with with the Enigma code and and um, Bletchley and all that sort of stuff. But I but I didn't really want to write a strict historical novel. I wanted to write a, a more or less present day thriller. The book is set in about 2015 or so. Um, and so, uh, you know, Patton finds this, uh, uncoded enigma message, um, uh, and she has this, meets up with this professional assassin, uh, and the two of them for various reasons have to try to uncode that message and, and react to what they discover. Um, so it starts out in rural North Carolina and, uh, eventually goes to Bletchley Park and then they end up going all over Europe, uh, on this, on this adventure. Wow. So that that really was um, the inspiration for your book. Yeah. I mean, I think really knowing knowing Mavis and having having spent time at Bletchley and and, you know, seeing how those machines worked and what a remarkable thing it was to for the for the British intelligence to to break that code and to, to you know, made a gigantic difference in the outcome of the war, really. Um, and yet these people kept it a secret for so long. And to me, that that felt like a world that it would be interesting to be in, uh, even if we're in it sort of slightly retrospectively um, you know, in this novel. And I guess the other inspiration, again, as I said before, is just wanting to write a, a thriller, wanting to write a book where you, you're you turning the pages fast and um, there's, there's sudden changes of fate that you don't see coming. 
and there are you know dramatic set pieces that you could imagine in a motion picture or that sort of thing um and so uh that that part of it was was a lot of fun to do as well mm -hmm. great so what kind of research did you have to do when you wrote this book and um, well, so one of the main things was just going back to Bletchley. We'd been there before, but when I started working on the book, I thought I really have to go back not only to see the machines that they have on display there uh, and see, you know, like not only learn how they work, but like, what do they sound like? What does it smell like to be in a room where this decoding machine is this giant thing the size of two or three refrigerators is is running? And, and um, uh so I, so I really wanted to spend some time at, at Bletchley while I was working on the novel um, with some sort of very specific uh, questions about it. And then there was also a lot of research into, into World War II. Heinrich Himmler is a character in the novel, and then there's a fictional character in the novel who's sort of his, um, his assistant. Um, and we get into some of the, a lot of the things that, that Himmler gets involved in in this, in this novel, as far-fetched as they sound, are actually based on historical fact. So, oh. um, so that was that was another another type of research. And and now, um, a lot of that I'm able to do online. Um, uh, you know, there's translations of his speeches. There's there's all sorts of information that, that that's available online. And I, and another thing I did with this book was I really wanted um, things to happen in really specific places. If I said I didn't want to just say they turned down a street in Munich. I wanted to tell you what street it was and you know where they were on the street. I would have to invent the street number because I don't want to send my readers to somebody's house, having them knock on the door and say, "Is this where so and so lived?" You know, <laughs> but um, I, you know, Google Earth and Google Street View are just gifts to the writer who wants to write about stuff in other countries and has not the time to travel to all those different places while they're working on the novel. So um, even tiny little towns in, in Germany and Austria and Italy, I was able to sort of really get a feel for the town a little bit uh, by just sort of driving around the town on, on Google Street View and seeing what the houses looked like, what kind of stores were they, you know, what, what was the, what did it feel like, you know. So, so there was a lot of that sort of practical research as well. Wow, that that's amazing. I, I hadn't even thought about that. That is a great idea. <laughs> so what, what's your favorite research story? Not not necessarily with this book, but all in any of your books. Um, you know, there's so many, I guess, you know, when I, I a lot of my books have a historical background. And so um, there's there's research involved. Um, and of course, I write nonfiction as well, so there's a lot of research involved in that. Um, but I, th I think one of the one of the ones that really sticks with me is um, was working on my novel, The Lost Book of the Grail, which is set in a medieval cathedral. And I wanted a lot of the book to be set in the cathedral library. And I've been to lots of medieval cathedrals, and I've often seen this sort of closed, big wooden door with a sign on it that said "Library not open to the public." And I thought, I want to see what's behind that door, you know. <laughs> and so um, one of the things we did when we were working on that, when I was working on that book, is my wife and I, um, we have a cottage in England. So we were staying over there for a while. And um, I started looking at what cathedrals would let you into the library. And Worcester Cathedral said for five pounds or something, you could take a tour of the library. So I signed us up um, and we went and I was thinking, you know, it'll be you know, a dozen people and they'll put us in the middle of the room and they'll go, here's a room full of old books. And that'll be worth the five pounds because I'll be able to sort of see how the room is laid out and feel, you know, again, what does it smell like? What does it sound like? Um, it turned out my wife and I were the only two people on the tour. We spent about an hour and a half with this librarian. She pulled so many books and manuscripts off the shelf. Like here's a here's a book from, you know, 950 AD still in its original binding. Um, <laughs> Here's here are these medieval manuscripts with these strange margin graffiti that we don't know what it what they mean, but isn't that fun to look at? And I'm, I mean, just book after book um, that she pulled off the shelves and showed us somehow or other ended up in the novel, um, and that was that was ninety minutes that was more valuable than any other two hundred hours of research that I could have done in, in any other way to be able to have an experience like that. Wow, that sounds incredible. Uh. I'd love to get there. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Were there any cool facts and findings that um, that didn't make it into your book that you love discovering? I mean, there's so much about, about Bletchley, um, not just about the way they broke the code, but about um, 
you know, about about well the horrible things that happened to Alan Turing afterwards, the mm -hmm. amazing way that they kept the whole thing a secret, even though there were thousands of people working there. Nobody in the general public knew what went on at Bletchley until the 1970s. Um, and then just sort of the daily life at Bletchley that they, you know, they put on plays and they had dances and they, you know, it was like, um, it was this community that, that had leisure time as well. And so a lot of that sort of stuff didn't, didn't really make it into the novel, but it was really fun to, to explore that whole world. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I just, I just am in awe of, of that. And then, you know, some of the code breaking things, there's, there's a lot of, um, there's some movies now about Bletchley and there's some other novels and they tend to do what movies and novels have to do, take a super complicated subject and kind of, you know, compress it a little bit. And so a lot of times the focus is, is on Alan Turing because he was one of the key people there. Absolutely. And, and without him, they probably wouldn't have broken the code. Um, but there were so many other people who were involved too, that it, it you know, learning about, about Gordon Welchman and about Dilly Knox and about Mavis Beatty and, and all these other people who, um, you know, just did this amazing work and were so creative in the way they figured out how to, how to break the codes. Um, but so, so there's not a lot of that technical stuff in the novel, um, but it was really fun to find out about. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So what was the biggest uh, challenge that you had in writing and, and putting out, um, you know, the, the Enigma Affair? So I think probably, you know, the biggest challenge for this, even though I mean, I mean, I've been talking a lot about Bletchley and about code breaking, there's only one scene in the novel that actually takes place at, at Bletchley. Um, and then once they once they break this code, you know, it goes on to these these other adventures. But trying to explain to the reader again the sort of technicality of how you went from a sheet of paper with letters on them on it that make no sense to breaking that code, and translating on an Enigma machine, and and figuring out what it means. I mean, this is something that super sophisticated mathematicians worked on for a long period of time. And I've got to try to explain it to the reader in a couple of paragraphs um, because you don't want to go on and on and on and on about the complications of it. Um, so that I think that was maybe the biggest challenge because I wanted to be really honest about what went into breaking the code, but also didn't want to slow down the book or um, you know have it be confusing or, or boring, um, but I wanted it to be accurate. You know, So that I think that was maybe those few paragraphs may have been the biggest challenge in the whole novel. Mm, yeah, shortening that. Wow, that that must have been very difficult. Okay, um, and uh, how did you overcome that challenge? How did you do that? So you know, I had a I had a book from Bletchley that sort of simplified um, the whole process for a, a tourist who's visiting Bletchley and got it down to you know instead of two or three volumes down to a little guidebook that's maybe twenty or thirty pages long. So so that was a really good first step and. Literally, I just read that book over and over and over again and thought, OK, which which steps can I just kind of, you know, mention very quickly and which things do I need to go into a little bit more detail on um, and, and eventually got it down. And then the other thing is to sort of not just not just stop the action and say, here's how you break the code, but to have it be a part of what's going on. And the character does a little bit at this point and then later on they have access to this machine and so they do this part of it and then later on they do this thing because they have access to this other machine um and so to not try to put it in all at once um and also to try to make it part of the action rather than something where you stop and explain things to the reader mm -hmm. okay um so what else can we expect from you in the future uh, well, that's a good question. I mean, uh, with three books coming out, I've been pretty busy uh, sort of promoting them. I have I have started to work on some future projects. Um, my middle grade book, The Book of the Seven Spells, is supposed to be the first of a trilogy. The second of those books has been written. Uh, and the third one I sort of started on a little bit, but I kind of didn't want to write the third one until I knew for sure that, the, that all three of them were going to be published. So, um, And then I have... Um, I have a possible future novel in progress, but I don't usually talk about my work in progress till it's till it's progressed pretty far. And this one is is in the early stages, but it's something that uh, I think might be a lot of fun to my readers um, who sort of like the world of of reading. They like the world of of old books and manuscripts and libraries and archives. Um, but they also, I hope, have a sense of humor. 
so I, I'm thinking about doing something that maybe has has a little wit attached to it. <laughs> oh, that sounds like fun. But you know, it's very interesting that that you've written two of the books, and you're not sure about the third one. So, how do, how do you feel about that? I mean. It just you've got all of these ideas in your mind and everything and you you know you've already written two parts of it um well you, you know yourself how it's going to end and yeah everything. i know i know the very end um and i know some of what's going to happen in book three but um you know when when we were editing book one we made a lot of changes and so mm -hmm. i don't want to start writing book three especially this is with a with a i don't know if i'd call this fantasy but with sort of a magical um world building kind of book where you have to set up these rules that are going to apply through all three books. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to be using a rule that I set up in book two while I'm writing book three. And then when we're editing book two, we change that rule for some reason, you know, uh, or we change a character. Oh. Like you, know, you want it to be consistent. So before I really dive deep into book three, I want to go through the editing process on book two and make sure that's set and we know what that's going to be so that then there won't be contradictions um, you know, between one volume and the next. Oh, that makes perfect sense. Right. Okay. Um, I have some questions now about being a writer. What's, sure. your what's your favorite part of being a writer? I mean, really my favorite part is connecting with readers. Um, it was so hard for me when my last novel, Escaping Dreamland, came out in September of 2020. Mm. Uh, and I, you know, I could I could go on Zoom like we are now but I didn't have that opportunity to, to be in a room full of readers, to talk to them passionately about the book, to take their questions and listen to their, um, uh, what interested them. And, and, and then also to connect, just to be hanging out at my local bookstore and somebody comes up and says, Hey, I read the new book and I was wondering about this or about that. You know, that, I, I really love that part of, of being a writer. And I missed that a lot <laughs> uh, with the last book. So we've got a lot of events planned um for this coming fall and hopefully i'll get to catch up with some readers that who i haven't seen in you know three or four years mm, hopefully covid won't get in the way of that either yeah, yeah, fingers crossed uh, wow okay um so what what's been your favorite adventure during your writing career um you know i think traveling for research um th there's been so many adventures that i've had on you know uh, my uh, my younger child, Jimmy, and I wandered all around the Lower East Side of New York when I was working on Escaping Dreamland, which is set in New York in 1906. And we were trying to find buildings that were still there that connected to the book. And uh, when I was working on First Impressions, going to Steventon, the little town where Jane Austen grew up and uh, seeing the church where her father was the was the vicar and just sort of seeing what the countryside felt like. I I, I feel a real connection between place and story. So it really helps me when I can, in spite of what I said about Google Earth, you know, it really helps me when I can, if I can, if I can be in that place to, to have been to Bletchley and really feel what it feels like to have been in that cathedral library, to have been in Jane Austen's hometown. Um, to me, those, those are the things where like, I'm simultaneously having a really cool, fun, interesting adventure and also learning a bunch of stuff that I need to know to write this next novel. And I like that when I can do both of those things at, at the same time. And and when I can have my wife with me or family members with me, you know, that that makes it that much better. Mm -hmm. And you can also get to talk to people there and, and learn little bits and pieces of information you wouldn't. Yeah, it's it's amazing to me what, you know, as much as we can learn on the internet, as much as we can benefit from digitized archives and digitized newspapers, which I used a lot for Escaping Dreamland, mm -hmm. um, there's just no substitution for for just having your feet on the ground in a place. And sometimes it's that it's that little stapled booklet that's a guide to the local church that tells you stuff that is not anywhere on the internet or anywhere else. You know? uh, and so you just yeah. never know where you're going to come across those little gems that that spark an idea or that fill in a little detail. Um, and, and, and again, sometimes it's just being there and feeling the space and, and trying to sort of understand it in, in three dimensions. Mm -hmm. True. So what's the greatest lesson that you've learned thus far in your writing career? Well, you know, my first um, commercial novel came out when I was 51 years old. So I, I would guess that maybe patience 
is is the greatest lesson I've learned: patience and and persistence. Um, I mean, I think that I think that and um, uh, making your own opportunities. I mean, there's there's been a lot of times in my writing career, especially earlier in my career, when um, I I had a successful writing experience because I went out and made the opportunity. My my wife was hired to work as a as a third grade drama teacher directing a third grade play um, at a local school, and she came to me and she said, "I can't find any good material for third graders. You're a writer. Why don't you write a play?" And I could have said, "I don't write children's plays," um, but instead I took that opportunity and then when that was a success I went to the head of the school and I said you know you don't have to pay me very much but you need to hire me put me on staff call me writer in residence and I'll write two plays every year for the younger kids and for the older kids and and I did that for 11 years wow. um, and and those plays have been produced in I think over 5,000 productions around the world because they've all they've all been published and, and widely produced and that was all because I forced somebody to give me a job. <laughs> you know, I, I made that opportunity. I didn't, I didn't wait for, for something to come along. So I think that making your own opportunities and then, and, and not assuming that one kind of writing is not what you want to do. Um, and also just being persistent and patient and not thinking that it's all going to happen for you the first time out. You know? Wow. So is, is that the piece of advice that you would um, give to other writers? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think those, those two things, um, about, you know, making your own opportunities, not closing doors just because you thought you didn't want to write children's plays or whatever it happens to be. And then just sticking, sticking with it. You know, it's, um, it's not rocket science, uh, but it's, it's a tough business. Um, and if you, if, if you can't have a thick skin, you can't, if you can't handle a lot of rejection notices, then it's probably not the business for you because all of us, even the, even the, writers that you look up to the most all have a drawer full of rejection slips or nowadays it's an email file but you know this is, amounts to the same thing <laughs> yeah several writers have told me that too yeah you've got to have a thick skin yeah, yeah. um now i have some uh, I actually i do have another question um are there any groups clubs or organizations that you would recommend um to other writers that might have helped you with your career so um you know i've never I, I I got an MFA at a non-residential program. And if anybody wants to get an MFA, I highly recommend a non-residential program because I think it is realistic in the way it models what the writing life really is. Because um, the writing life is not about going into a classroom five days a week and having somebody check on your assignment. It's about sitting alone and once every few weeks or every few months, sending something to somebody else, you know. So, um, so that program worked really well for me. Um, I've never really been a user of writers groups as far as you know, reading my new material to somebody. I mean, my writers group in that sense is my wife and my agent and my editor. You know, those are the people who, who I share materials with before it's, you know, when it's still in in process. Um, uh, but I, a friend of mine recently started a group here in town of sort of other established professional writers where our idea is we would just get together and chat. And it's not about sharing material or trying to get feedback. It's just about being around other people who sort of live in the same world that we live in. Um, Cause one of the things about being a writer is you don't, you don't get to go to work in a building that has a bunch of other writers in it. Usually, you know, mm -hmm. it's not like being a doctor or, or a lawyer or, a, or, you know, um, a lot of other professions where you have a network just sort of built into your daily life. So I think, I think creating a network is great. I mean, we have a fantastic nonprofit here in Winston-Salem called Bookmarks um, that, that not only puts on a book festival, but they run an independent bookstore and they have author events, you know, multiple times a week. Um, I have a podcast where I interview other authors. So I've done, there's a lot of things that I've been involved in that have allowed me to sort of be a part of a wider network of authors um and and to me i find that helpful just not necessarily in the nitty-gritty of what am i going to write about or how am i going to write this chapter but just in terms of not feeling alone out there as a writer wow okay um now i have questions about you as a person mm -hmm. what is one thing that most people don't know about you i don't know i'm a pretty open book but i guess the fact that i'm an introvert uh, because I love to stand up in front of groups of people, um, but I'm I'm not so good when it comes to one on one. I'm talking to a stranger, uh, so 
I'm like I you know I was a theater major I'm an actor so I know how to I know how to do the there's a bunch of people in the room take center stage um <laughs> yeah but uh but and that's the funny thing about being a writer is we're expected to be introverts for you know 18 months and then we're supposed to go out for three weeks and be extroverts uh and I, I do like both of those things but I think I think sometimes people think I'm more of a extrovert than maybe I really am I don't know <laughs> mm, interesting um, many authors that I've spoken with have, have said that they were introverts. And I guess it kind of goes with the job because you're you're sitting there by yourself and you're it writing. Is. Yeah, I mean, it's a necessarily solo activity as is reading a necessarily yes. solo activity. I mean, you can read aloud to a group of people. And I love doing that with with children, especially. But but essentially, for most of us, reading is, is a, a solo activity. That's why really admire um, what Bookmarks has done because they they have created a community out of a, a solitary activity, out of the activity of reading and the activity of writing. Um, and so I think I think there's a lot of room in the world for more places like that, for literary nonprofits to create that kind of community that, that allows all us introverted readers and writers uh, to meet other introverted readers and writers and maybe learn how to talk to each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great idea. Um, all right. What is or are your passions um, when you're not writing and how do you make time to do the things that you love? Um, well, I'm a, as you might be able to guess from looking behind me, I'm a, I'm a book collector. I, I collect um, the works of Lewis Carroll, also known as Charles Dodson, um, and have, you know, a house crammed full of everything from playbills to um, first editions to, we can't quite see it behind me, but Lewis Carroll's typewriter is back there wow. uh, from 1888. Um, so that's that's certainly one of my big passions. Um, I was thinking about this the other day about how so many of the things that I still, that I, that I consider my sort of co-curricular activities um, are things that I started doing in, in grade school and high school, certainly by college, you know. Um, I, I still sing in a choir, which I did growing up and, and all through um, school. I uh, I run, which I did very seriously in junior high school and high school, and then didn't run for a long time and then started up again about 10 or 12 years ago. Um, and that was great during COVID, I, you know, just to be able to get out of the house. Um, I decided I was going to run every street in my neighborhood. And even though I've lived here most of my life, there were streets I'd never been on before. Um, and it just sort of gave me something different to do instead of just running the same path every day and i and i love that too because when i am somewhere else when, when we're in england or when we're you know when we're visiting in, in new york or it's just it's great it's a great way to see a city or or the countryside in a way that you wouldn't if you were not going to go out and run six or seven or eight miles that day you know uh it's it's so um yeah those are those are and, and I, you know, I love to travel. Travel is sometimes is linked to work and sometimes isn't. Um, you know, we missed that during COVID. I'm a, my wife and I are, are um, old theater folk. And so we, uh, I, I did some acting for the first time in a long time. I was, I actually played the lead in a play in the, in the spring. I'd forgotten what it's like to try to learn hundreds of lines of dialogue, but uh, <laughs> I managed to, managed to, to do that again. Um, but just also theater going, and I'm, I'm in involved in playwriting as well, which is, is part of writing, but it's a place where my, my love for the theater and my love for writing kind of, kind of come together. Um, and in fact, I have, I have a new adaptation of A Christmas Carol that's going to be put on by uh, our local community theater here in Winston-Salem was commissioned uh, in December. So that's, I'm excited to see how that, um, uh, how that looks on the stage. Mm, so are, are those plays actually published and distributed elsewhere? So my children's plays are the, I've, I've been working on two plays lately. One is the, is the Christmas Carol. And then um, I was asked by the same group um, if I would adapt one of my novels um, for the stage. And so I've been working with a, a group of actors and a director uh, and we've been sort of in development on a script um, based on my novel, Escaping Dreamland. Um, and in fact, we had the actors here at the house last night, uh, did a read through of the latest version of the script. And I think we all feel like we're just about there. We're, we're about ready to hand it over to the producers. Um, it won't, it won't be produced until I think the end of 2023, just because they have to wait till there's a slot in the calendar. Um, but that's been a, a fascinating experience for me because I had, I'd written plays from scratch. Um, I'd written plays that were adaptations of other people's works, like A Christmas Carol, but I never tried to take my own, one of my own novels and turn it into a play. 
Uh, and it was really great. I'd also never written a play where I involved um, other actors and other theater professionals in the process from the very beginning of the process. Um, so it's been it's been very interesting. And the play is very different from the book. Um, not Obviously, you have to cut a lot out, but there's scenes that we put in the play that are not in the book. Uh, and it was really interesting to see how that process developed over time. And we spent we've spent a little over a year working on that on that script. You know, I mean, we would meet, you know, for an evening and then we'd meet again three months later. It's not like we've been working on it every night or anything, but um, but it's been a really fun process. Hmm. Wow. That sounds great. Um, so what does your writing space look like and uh, what do you need to have around you when you're writing and editing? So I, I write mostly in the space that you can see on this video. If you're watching the video, it's um, it's an upstairs space with lots of bookcases. And there's a pool table in the middle of the room that I almost never use to play pool on because there's always some sort of project laid out on it or <laughs> uh, books stacked up on it. Um, I My desk is, you can't see my desk right now, but it is piled with books and papers. I'm working on some Lewis Carroll research right now. And so I've got a bunch of um primary and secondary materials laid out on, 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 I mean, laid out's not really the right word because that makes it sound like it's organized and it's really not, <laughs> uh, but sort of scattered all about. And then about once a month, I'd be like, I got to clean this place up. And so, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll work for half a day and then the desk will be all clean and the, and the pool table will be cleaned off. And, you know, then I'll, then we start to accumulate things again. Um, and as far as what I, what I need, I mean, I typically, uh, work on the computer. Um, a lot of times if I'm, if I'm editing, I do like to print out and edit with a pen. Um, but if I'm, if I'm starting a draft, I, I typically start it on the computer. Although I will, I will have, you know, pieces of paper with, I don't know if you can see what's on there, but with little notes, you know, uh, as I'm working, as I'm getting ideas, I'll, I'll write notes down. Um, I have a tendency to, to get into bed at night and suddenly think of 12 good ideas. And so I will email myself so that those are on my desktop the next morning when I when I get back <laughs> up. Um, and it depends on, on where I am in a project too. I mean, right now, a lot of the work that I'm doing is preparing for these three books to come out. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm deep in the midst of a novel, then again, if there's a lot of research involved in it, then that might be what's piled up on the desk. Um, if I'm in a third draft, then I might have the second draft scattered over here with notes all over it and and be working from that so it just it just kind of varies depending on what what part of the process i'm working on now do you have i uh, have to have some food or drink with you oh i don't have to but i i usually there's usually some um comestible on the on the on the desk somewhere i'm trying to look and see if there's anything right now there's a there's an empty plate right now so there obviously was some food sometime <laughs> fairly recently uh at least in the last day or two you know? <laughs> like water or coffee or yeah there's um, i mean first thing in the, i i drink coca-cola first thing in the morning so you know that's that's usually there and and uh i mean first thing is not necessarily particularly early for me but when i'm ready to drink something you know uh, Okay. And when you're writing um, or editing, do you listen to music or do you prefer silence? Um, I usually have it quiet. I'm not, I mean, I, I could have some classical music playing quietly in the background. I don't think that would bother me. Um, but usually, usually it's, it's pretty quiet until the dog who's sitting in the window spies the UPS guy coming up the driveway and then it gets pretty noisy just for, you know, a few seconds right then. You know? <laughs> That's my next question. Um, writers uh, very often have uh, furry or feathered or otherwise yeah. non-human companions uh, with them to um, and through their work. And uh, do you have any, which you do, um, uh, and, do they help you or hinder you? I've got to see if she's here. Hey, run, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run and get her. She's right over here. So <laughs> she's making her appearance. Come here, Rosie. So this is this is Rosie. Rosie was our Rosie was our COVID dog. Rosie loves other people, and poor thing, she didn't know there were any other people for about six months after we got her because it was during lockdown. So. <laughs> um, but she very often sits up here with me during the day, partly because there's a there's a sofa by a window, and she can sit in that sofa and watch the outside. And as I said, she will always announce if there's somebody coming up the driveway. Uh, is that so? She's um no but she doesn't bother me she's she's every once in a while and she tends to do this right when i'm in the middle of a podcast i'm surprised she didn't do this while we've been talking um she'll come over and sit next to me and whine don't want to want to get up on my lap 
And so <laughs> I'm talking to like the other day, I was talking to Jamie Ford and I'm, you know, juggling the, the dog in one hand and my questions in the other hand. <laughs> and, you know, but generally she's pretty sweet. You know? oh, yeah, I'll be talking to Jamie too. <laughs> oh, she looks adorable. What kind of dog is that? She is actually um a cavapoo. So she is half cavalier King Charles Spaniel and half poodle. We had my my stepmother raised cavaliers for decades and and we had had those in the past, but we were sort of ready for a dog that wasn't going to shed hair quite so much. So <laughs> she's been she's been good on that front. Yeah. Oh, that's great. <laughs> now I just have two more questions for you. One is um, where can people find your work aside from Annie's Bookstop of Worcester? And sure. I always I always have to um, to put a plug in for Annie's, and yeah. um, you can uh, you can get <laughs> you can get Charlie's books there at Annie's. Um, if you if you call us at five zero eight seven nine six five six one three, or if you email us at uh, orders at Annie's Books Worcester dot com. So where else could people find your books? Um, I mean, you can find my books wherever books are sold. But I would certainly encourage you to patronize your local independent bookseller um, if you're. If you're in my neck of the woods, you can always find signed copies um, at Bookmarks here in Winston-Salem. Um, and, and then you can find out more on my website, which is charlielovett.com, or you can follow me on um, Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. Uh, and if, you know, as new books come out or interesting things happen, I, I will um, I will try to list them there. And there's also a place on my website um, for events, which was a sadly blank page for a couple of years there, but now there's uh, there's a lot uh, on there, and who knows, maybe I'll get up to Worcester. I, my uh, my younger child went to school at um, Hampshire College outside of Amherst, oh. so uh, I was I was in that area not infrequently for four years, um, but it's it's been a while since I've been up there, but I but I I love it. It's a beautiful part of the world. Mm, yes, it it really is. Oh, great. Um, well, you answered my second question too, which is how can we follow you, your work and share your awesomeness? So, <laughs> um, yeah, the other thing you can do is you can listen to my podcast, which is called Inside the Writer Studio. Um, we have, I think I just recorded our 104th episode. So um, wow. when, when Bookmarks open its independent bookstore, I really wanted to take what we do, conversation with writers and make them sort of more widely available. Um, but I also wanted, after many years of being the writer who was getting interviewed, um, I, I thought it would be nice to have a writer interview other writers and that we might be able to sort of dig, dig a little deeper than a lot of press interviews go. Uh, and so that's been really fun. And I'll, I'll have um, debut novelists on there. And I've had, you know, Louise Penny and Ian McEwen and John Grisham. And then we just had Jamie Ford. And, um, uh, you know, so it's been it's it's been great. I used to do a lot of those interviews in person. And then when COVID came along, I started just doing them almost exclusively uh, on Zoom. But that sort of makes it easier for um, for authors who are on tour. And they don't necessarily have to be coming through Winston-Salem for me to uh, to interview them. But um, that's that's definitely something else you can um, follow. And and I think I'm going to have, I believe, Ann Bogle, who goes by the modern Mrs. Darcy, is going to be a guest host for me coming up to interview me about the Enigma Affair. So oh, great. Uh, I will be the guest on my own show. That'll that'll be fun. Wonderful. <laughs> great. Well, thank you very much, Charlie. Um, it was uh, wonderful speaking with you. And maybe you will get to, uh, to Worcester and come and visit us at, at Annie's. I hope so. That would be great. Great. Well, thanks again, Charlie. Love it. Thank you. Okay. All right. Bye. All right. Thanks. I appreciate it.